Thank you, Stan. What a beautiful song. What's well, true words, isn't it? Maybe it's not something we think about very often because our minds and our lives are filled with so much that's happening in this world. I want to share with you a, a story, uh, and then I also want to say thank you for allowing me to be a, a pastor here at Mount Tabor Baptist Church. What a joy it is. I have opportunities that a lot of people perhaps don't have, and one of the great opportunities is to, to meet people outside of my church. So I had a, a young couple call me and uh, said, we'd like to talk to you about doing our wedding. And I don't remember ever meeting them before, but I set up an appointment that came to my office. And, and I asked a question, I think, that, uh, that, that, that first popped into my mind was, why would you want an old guy like me to do your wedding? And the young lady said, well, we had everything planned. We had us an officiant, and we had a place, and this guy was going to do our wedding. He told us how much it was going to cost, and everything was set. Again, I'm thinking, why are we talking? She said, but that night I went home and I had a dream. She said, the dream was that when the officiant, when he opened the Word of God, there was no Word in it. So she was, I think, startled by that. So she goes to the first person that we all go to that still have them living, her mama. And she said, Mom, I had this dream, and when this guy opened the word, there was no word in it, just a cover. And her mama said, well, you better go find somebody that knows the word. And I thought, man, that's, that's what we need today. In this text, it says it this way, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And I want to invite you this morning to hear his word, to answer the question that's been posed, are you ready? If he comes this afternoon, are you ready? I mean, really ready in your heart. Because it's going to be a shame on that day for the people that weren't ready. At new church and, and knew all kinds of good things, dressed well. But that's not the question. Are you ready to meet the Lord? I entitled this sermon, The Eternal Words. Hear God's Word today. Would you please stand? Matthew chapter 24, this eschatological end time discussion from Jesus before he gets ready to go spread his arms on the cross to die for the world. He says, From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near. At the very gates, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. May God bless his word to our hearing. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for this day. and We, we ask that you help us to hear your word. And Lord, today, would you work in a way that only you can? Would you speak in a way that only you can? That this might not be about our deliberation about what I say, but it might be in consideration of what you say. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Quick for an old man. Do you believe the end is near? You know, Jesus is really talking about 2,000 years ago. He's talking to the crowd. It's a Wednesday in the last week of his life. He's going to a place that has been determined, I believe, 
throughout the ages. To a place on Friday, they call it Good Friday. It's a place where we plant our crops because we believe if we'll plant them on the day that he was buried, then these crops will rise again. Do you believe the end is near? It's a question I think we all need to consider. This week, I sometimes call our shut-ins to talk to them on the phone. I love that as well. I get to hear about them. And um, I was talking to one this week, and she said, Have you heard? I said, have I heard what? She said, have you heard what they're saying on this AM radio station here in Anderson? And I couldn't honestly say that I heard. You know, as Reggie said, let me put it to you this way. I was scrolling down my Microsoft page on my computer that Reg bought me, and it said, This news agency is the most listened to in the land. And I made note of that news agency, and I scroll on down. It's about 68 pages or something. And believe it or not, they said, another news agency is the most listened to in America. And I thought, you just said the opposite thing on the same page. Now, I know that y'all are a lot brighter than me. I don't doubt that at all. And maybe you want to listen to inconsistencies, lies, and rumors, and gossip. And if you do, God bless you. But what bothered me about this shut-in in our church family was that she was listening to the news in such a way that it was burden, It was a burden for her heart. They were telling her things, and, and, and she can't drive much and, and it's hard for her to get out and, and they were telling her fill up everything get your freezer full get your refrigerator full get your toilet paper y'all remember that now for illustration's sake I'm not making fun of you if you took your pickup truck down to the Walmart and bought you 800 rows of Charmin Super Soft But I'm going to tell you something. I don't know about your family. And you can email me about this sermon later. But my family never ran out of toilet paper. But but sometimes, instead of living by just trusting God, we live by fear. We live by the fear of what's going to be. And I'm going to tell you, if you're going to live by fear of anything, you ought to live by fear of this. That he's coming again. That the conditions are ready. It could happen anytime. Whether you have toilet paper or not. Do you believe the end is near? If you believe the radio personality, you will stock up on resources. But you believe Jesus is coming, you'll live for him and by him. Have you ever thought that maybe God's called us here to this service that we've come from all these different places to hear His Word and to be comforted by it so that we might live by faith in God, not fear of man or circumstances? The hymn writer put it this way. I care not today what tomorrow may bring. If shadow or sunshine or rain The Lord, I know, ruleth over everything, and all of my worry is vain. Because I'm living by faith in Jesus alone, trusting, confiding in His great Word. Love. Word. Listen, friend. If God rules and reigns, He controls everything. We call Him the Almighty, the All-Knowing, the One who is everywhere. So I want to encourage you today to live by faith in God or place 
your faith in God. With all the things that you are worried about this morning. See, he says in verse 32 and 33, he says, he, he's really talking about, man, I remember the first time I preached this year on figs. Man, I must have had a five-gallon bucket of figs brought to me. But I'm telling you, I'm preaching on figs again. I guarantee you Jeff Burke will not bring me a plastic bag tomorrow with figs because the figs are gone. And, and, and that's what Jesus is saying. Man, if you know the signs and you can see the things, have you thought, you know, this morning I come in, I said, should I turn the air on or not? It was 51 degrees. But in here, it was 69. You know, and I know if we need to turn the air on or not. I turned it on. It's running right now. Some of you are cold, some of you are hot. But that's what Jesus is saying. Man, if you can see and know when the grass needs to be cut, or if you can understand what you need to put in that pound cake to get it right, you ought to be able to see the times. Hear these verses. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that, listen to this, He is near. The He here is Jesus. He's at the very gates. It's a picture of, of Him being ready to come at any moment. You know, this whole chapter 24 of Matthew, study of the end times, or the big word, eschatological. I never have understood why we use hard words to say simple things. Jesus is simply saying, if you can see what's happening in nature and you know winter's coming, if you can see what's happening with fig trees, you ought to be able to see the times. It says earlier in this chapter that the temple will be destroyed. And I talked last week about the times it's already been destroyed. It's already happened. Or, or, or Daniel preached that, that, that many will lie to you in this day. You better be careful what you listen to and what you live by. I don't say that to scare you. I, I tell you that because it's the truth. Many will lie to you. Wars and rumors of wars. Um, you may be murdered for my name's sake. There will be great trials and difficulties. All these things have already happened. They've already happened. Look what Jesus says in verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things might take place. You know, for a long time I was very confused about this verse. I thought it meant that he was going to come in that generation. But I misread the sentence. I'm glad the English teacher's not here today. The grammar of the construction of this really says these things, it's talking about the things he's already talked about in 24. All these things will happen in this generation. It doesn't mean he's coming in the generation in which he went to the cross. It means that everything's happened. He could come any time. Any time. So since his going to the cross, everything has been ready for his coming. Or you might think of it this way. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says... You shall bruise his heel. He shall crush your head. It's the first time that the gospel is preached about what Jesus was going to do in those end times. Nobody knew when he was coming. Now, he gave indicators, I'm going to be born in Bethlehem and all kinds of things like that. Isaiah 7, 14, he's going to be born by a young woman who's a virgin, I believe. But he could come any time the first time. And the funny thing is, people didn't even recognize when he came the first time. Don't you think we ought to give it some consideration about him coming back the second time? About the imminent return of our Lord and our God? Everything is ready for his coming. How do you know, Philip? Are you like those guys on Christian television that, that can read the newspaper and see the future? No, sir, I am not. I don't know when. I don't know how. I just know that He's coming. 
And my responsibility is to be ready for his coming. Do you believe the end is near? Then live by faith in God. First and foremost and always. And he'll take care of everything else in your life. Secondly, everything is ready for his second coming. Now here's the personal application. If you don't hear anything else today, you got to hear this. If God brought you here for this hour, and, and he wants to encourage you or speak to you, I want to ask that you listen. The question is not, is it time? The question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Because sometimes I think we, we think that, that, that we're only ready if our life is together. We're only ready if we're in Sunday school. By the way, I heard this question in Sunday school. I love my Sunday school and my teachers. I can't wait to hear my wife today. Man, my wife can preach it. Last week, Rod was preaching it. And somebody in the class raised their hand and said, we were talking about the gospel, you know, the books of the prison epistles that we're in right now and we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and one person raised their hand I thought they had a great question because sometimes we miss this and if you miss this you miss it all we think that we have to be good and everything in our lives together and, and we don't have anything in our life that ain't right that's a lie from Satan. My wife calls that one of the biggest hindrances to the church of God because we think salvation comes from our living, not what he has done on the cross and his resurrection and him being on the throne. She asked this question. If you have a serial killer, y'all know what a serial killer is? It's not breakfast food. It's spelled with an S. And this is a person who has no conscience. They, they sort of kill as sport human beings or, or take their lives just arbitrarily. No, and that's why they're so hard to catch because they, they don't do it according to, you know, most of us just kill our family, <laughs> you know, because we're mad as fire about something. She said, what if a serial killer went down to Lee County Jail incarcerated in solitary confinement? And the chaplain of the Lee County Correctional Center comes in and he leads that serial killer to life everlasting through confessing with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in his heart. Would he go to heaven? I thought, man, that's a good question. Because most of us think what? Well, I ain't quite good enough to get in heaven. I tell you what, I can't go to that altar today. I'm embarrassed. I'm nervous. E-I-E-I-O. I'm just going to try to do better. And we leave this church thinking, I need to do better. No, friend. Whatever you do is never going to save you eternally. There's nothing you can do. You can be the highest Presbyterian or the lowest Baptist, but it's not going to be in what you've done that makes you right with God. And so as we were considering this question, I thought, well, I know a place in the Bible where that exact situation is. In Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 39, and it's talking about this was on Wednesday, this text, but on Friday, on Friday, Jesus was being put to death. Now, he had never done anything wrong. He wasn't being put to death for what he'd done wrong. He has been put to death for what you've done wrong. Mm, yeah, somebody ought to go, mm. Somebody ought to realize today that if you're in Him, you've been set free eternally. If you're in Him, you got life that'll never stop. Toilet paper or not. And the text says, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, 
And listen to what he says, verse 41. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Now, I want you to underline that today. And I want you to remember that no matter what the commentators say on the MS channel, that our God had done nothing wrong. He didn't die for his own sins. He died for the sin of humanity. Verse 41, he had done nothing wrong. Verse 42, and he said, Jesus. Listen to this. You notice what he says, 41. Don't you know this is God? Verse 42. Jesus, he said, remember me when you come in to your kingdom. See, we make salvation complicated. We make it like you got to say a certain thing or do a certain thing or be a certain thing. But right here in this text, at the end of this brother's life, he placed his face, faith in Jesus. He confessed with his mouth, Will you remember me? That's what salvation is. It's a big word for a life change that Jesus does in your life, not something you do in yourself. Now, sanctification is something that you do. You live for God. You love God. 42. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, I love love this. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I don't know what you think, but today in my Bible means today. I don't believe he was talking about some future rising up. I believe he was talking about today. You'll be with me in paradise. So here you have a man who's convicted to die because of the way he lived, and Jesus erases it all in one word. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Man, I don't know about you. But that's the gospel. And see, no matter if we're in end times, hard times, difficult times, Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our salvation. And I want to ask you today, don't let Satan, the children's song says, blow it out. Because he's coming to some of you. He said, you ain't worthy. You ain't right. You ain't doing what you're supposed to. You ain't done enough. You need to do more. I'm telling you something, friend. That our God on the cross did more than was necessary to save the sins of the whole world. If you understand what I'm talking about, say amen. You don't come to Him thinking I'm going to do better. You come to Him saying, Lord, I believe that You are the way, the truth, and the life. That no man comes to the Father but by you. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And that's what needs to go out in this land, I believe. Because I believe once you hear it, you're going to travel from near and far to worship Him, to walk with Him, to be about your Father's business. Because He's made you uniquely. And He's got a purpose and plan for your life. And it's way better than anything we can think or consider. I'm preaching now. I need to slow down. I'm scaring the guests. I want to ask you this question this morning. Are you ready? Not are your children ready? Not are your grandchildren ready? Not is anybody else ready? But are you ready? If today's your last day and you'll never be in this sanctuary again alive, are you ready to go? And I want to ask you if you're not ready. Don't you let embarrassment, nervousness, or anything stop you from getting right this morning. From getting right today. All you got to do is believe. He'll take it from there. I like the way it says it in John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, when it says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Verse 1. Verse 12 says,
but to all. Not some, not a certain color, not a certain sin, but to all who did receive him. To them he gave, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. All you've got to do this morning is believe and receive. I want to ask you this morning to confess that Jesus is Lord. I want to ask you this morning to believe in your heart. You will be saved. He'll change your life this morning. Only he can. In just a minute, we're going to have an invitation. I'm going to pray before that invitation. If you believe and receive him today, and get right with God, I want to ask you to come to the front of this church. We want to share it with everybody what God's done in your life. If you understand, say amen. In our text, in verse 35, Jesus tells us something that's guaranteed. I believe it's a promise. Heaven and earth will pass away. You know, it's sort of discouraging. I'm building a new home. <laughs> it's going to be gone soon. Heaven and earth will pass away. But the word of God will not pass away. Hear God's word this morning and respond to it. Will you stand? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, we come before you this morning. And I pray that you'd call out, come to me. And those who are heavy laden, Lord, would receive and believe. In Jesus' name we pray. And then, Father, I pray for those that are, that are ready. That you'd work in their lives that they would hear your word. It would be amplified in a way that it would drown out the word of man, which is changing. So, Lord, you have your way in this place. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You sing and respond. Being a part of our worship service today, we pray that you'd experience God's grace or his word. And because we can't see you, but you can see us, we want you to know that we care about you. And there may be a need that you have, a prayer concern. Uh, maybe you want to know more about uh, our Lord and Savior. And we want to be there to help you, to connect with you. So we want to put on the screen a number that you could call. We'd love to be in touch with you and help you in any way we can. Uh, also... Uh, you may have something that you need a pastor for, and we'd like to meet that need for you as well. Call us. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for being with us. May God bless you.